ready to officially get started, I'd like to welcome to the stage the CEO for Search for Common Ground, Shamu Idris. Thank you. Great, so thank you all so much. Thank you everybody who's in the room with us uh, today and everyone who is uh, logging on to follow us on YouTube. It's great to have you here. Uh, I am the CEO of Search for Common Ground. Uh, we are the world's largest uh, non-governmental organization dedicated to peace building with over 700 very courageous uh, and creative staff uh, working in conflicts around the world uh, from Myanmar to Nigeria to Yemen to Syria. Uh, Kyrgyzstan, Sri Lanka, and many other locations. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, we have for 20 years been organizing awards events uh, where we celebrate everyone from presidents uh, to taxi drivers and others and everything in between for courageous peace building. We've been doing that for 20 years. But this year on the 20th anniversary of doing those kinds of events, we thought we should do something different. We have such extraordinary honorees here with us, and yesterday we had our awards event in the House of Lords. Um, and we featured uh, our awardee from last year, President Otun Beva from Kyrgyzstan. Um, uh, she was celebrated last year. And this year we had President uh, Tumara Tunga from Sri Lanka uh, celebrated. And we thought if we're gonna bring them all the way here for an awards event, it's really a shame to give them only three to five minutes for acceptance speeches and honoring speeches. So we wanted to take the opportunity of organizing this master class where they'll have an opportunity to have a moderated, intimate conversation with one another and then with all of you, those in the room and those watching online. Uh, and so that's what we're doing. This will be the first of what will become a series of master classes on peace building. Now, if you have um, any takeaways, those of you who are in the room, that are interesting to you, insights that you'd like to share, aha moments, you'll see that we do have on the wall over there, it's called the big takeaway wall, the clear paneling there. There are markers next to it and we encourage you after the conversation, please wait till the conversation's over, but after the conversation, feel free to write up any insights or thoughts that you had or takeaways and we have candy there which is your takeaway, but you only get to take the candy if you leave an insightful comment uh, or, or, or moment. Uh, you also all have, for those of you in the room, uh, these notebooks. Uh, and you will see that there's a small count me in card that you can pull out. Uh, if there's anything that you would like to ask uh, that you don't want to publicly ask on the wall, you can write it there. Or if you just like to stay in touch with us, being sure that you get invited to these kinds of events in the future, you can please note your contacts there. I'm going to repeat uh, what my colleague Carl Davis said, which is this is the one event when we're not going to ask you to turn off your phone. I would ask you to mute your phone, but we'd like you to take pictures, to tweet out, to post on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever it might be, under the hashtag she the peace builder campaign, please. And with that, I'm going to introduce our esteemed moderator. So Emily Castriel is an editor with BBC, but she's also the leader of the Crossing Divides project there, which is an extraordinarily ambitious effort to enable people and encourage people and show people um, uh, how they can bridge their differences across ethnic, religious, political, uh, generational divides. This is being rolled out across BBC's many platforms, local, national, international, television, radio, and online platforms. And for those of you in the UK or just following the BBC UK around the world, last Friday they held Crossing the Divides, Crossing Divides on the Move, an idea which I loved, which partnered, had the BBC partnering with eight major transportation companies to document and show people having conversations on their way to work, on their commutes across the UK's dividing lines. And that just happened last Friday. So a great idea that I think we should do in every country around the world. But with that, I want to invite the mastermind behind that idea, Emily Castriel, and our moderator for today. Emily. Thank you so very much. Um, I've got a mic here. Oh, Samuel, for that fantastic introduction. And it's really great to be here. And I should say, though, I'm here in my, per oops, in my personal, that. sorry about that, in my personal capacity, although because of my work in Crossing Divides, it's something that I have a great deal of interest for. So a very warm welcome on behalf of Search for Common Ground here. And it's a real, um, you know, reading more about Search for Common Ground and the interest that the organization has about bringing people together to understand and to build a better future together. And so I thought, what a fantastic opportunity to hear from two women 
who eat. So she's been grappling with some of the hardest challenges as leaders dealing with their nations in conflict. And um, I hope the conversation is going to be so gripping that the only reason you're going to want to look at your phone is because you're going to tweet using the hashtag uh, she the peace builder. But of course, delighted not just to welcome the people here, but also those who are taking part live streaming on YouTube. And we have people in Kyrgyzstan, we have people in America, in Rwanda, in Sri Lanka. So a big welcome to you. And we will be taking, we'll have a really substantial chunk of our discussion as Q&A and also be looking forward to hearing questions from those countries. So I would like to begin by introducing our first speaker, your Excellency Chandrika Bandaranaika Kumaratunga, and I'm grateful that she has allowed me to call her CBK for short, the former president of Sri Lanka. And we'll begin just before she comes to the stage, but maybe you want to come and see this short film about you that Search for Common Ground has seen. So perhaps why don't you come to the stage and then you can turn round while we're playing the film before we begin to talk. But uh, maybe we should give her a warm welcome. <laughs> So perhaps we could play this film. All three of us, the three siblings, were at school. Uh, my older sister and my younger brother. And our nanny was sent to tell us. So she came and said, your father has been shot. Very crudely, no, no diplomacy. Um, and said, come, come, you have to go home. He was not there. He was already taken to hospital. We were greeted by a pool of blood on the floor, which was horrific. So it was just shock. Prachanda Desha Parane Mulma Vedi Muraya Eyavi Minis Vesin Avimukti Handa Akale Nesuni My parents never told us that we should uh, enter politics or they didn't try to direct us into what we should do in, in our lives. And I decided very young that I was going to shun politics because, because of the, the negative things I had seen happening to our family. Yeah, I was at home that it was a holiday, a public holiday, and the Children were not going to school, obviously, they didn't need to. And normally he would take them and drop them off at school because he ha hardly had time for them the rest of the day. And he was actually uh, leaving for, for a luncheon appointment with the political uh, secretary of the US Embassy. I was downstairs by the staircase talking to my secretary. When he came down, he loved perfume, so he was smelling nice. <laughs> and uh, he said, okay, uh, uh, I'll see you later, I'm going for the lunch. And then he went out and he went to his car. And then suddenly I heard shots. I heard his voice shouting out. And I started running out. I didn't think twice about anything, I just ran out. They got him outside the gates. I saw him falling on the ground. He had tried to come running into the house with the shots in his body, but he fell at the gate. The shock was so big that I didn't I think I went into denial. I didn't want to think he was dead. So I said, take him quickly to hospital, to the emergency ward, to see what we can do. So uh, when I went out, what I saw was the children coming, running in, saying, daddy, daddy, like that. So uh, I ran in, took the children, cuddled them.
I finished the speech and I was coming down into the car to go home when this uh, suicide bomber girl blasted herself. I was still conscious. After this and I was giving directions to the security guard to take me. I'm supposed to be very bossy, so I was true to form. Well, I never thought for a moment I'll die. The first thing I thought of was my children. Because I thought, oh my God, they've gone through this so many times. I don't want to see me, see th them to see me in this condition. I, did, I didn't ask for a mirror, but I knew I must be looking awful. And uh, because apparently this was all swollen and black and blood all over. The young people are running around on the, running amok on the streets saying they are going to get all the UN peers and the Tamils. I heard this and I thought, gosh, and my mind clicked immediately. And I said, send for my secretary again. He was outside. And I said, go now to the television and make a statement as my secretary. Everybody knew he was my secretary. And say that I'm fine. Say that I have no injuries. I have only a slight injury to my face. I had more serious, but I said, you know, underplay it. And uh, tell them that the only thing I want them to do is to, I didn't say don't kill anybody, but then they would have got more excited is to go, I'm much, I'm fine, but I need uh, their prayers. Tell them to go to their places of worship and start praying for them. As soon as this was announced, my people had uh, something to hang on to. They had gone and said, Madam said to go and pray for her, now come and they were able to, you know, calm them down and they all went by their thousands to the temple and started praying. That's how it happened. Even at that moment, I didn't feel revenge. I think my very first initiation into what I am doing now, ensuring that everybody gets equal rights and equal respect and dignity, definitely came from my father. Good planning, good governance, uh, that's I would want that, like that to happen. So democracy, anti-corruption, and peace. A country where all the communities living in it uh, have equal rights and can live with dignity. by you and your family and it, it's you know quite extraordinary for so much to happen to one person but taking you back you were of course educated at the science po in paris political science degree and then you started doing a phd in development economics but you stopped that in order to go back to sri lanka and you it's a good drag back dragged back <laughs> dragged back okay <laughs> by your by the people, by the people. okay Some people. And then you became prime minister and then president. And it was very tough years for Sri Lanka, of course, because your, your country was embattled in a very bloody civil war. And you yourself made many efforts, especially in the early days, to make peace with the Tamils. But there were also some very significant human rights abuses under your watch, restrictions on the media, disappearance, while the army itself was fighting the Tamil rebels who themselves were committing some really horrific acts of terror and suicide bombings. But since leaving office, you have chosen to speak out against the government in Sri Lanka, condemning it at times for failing to share power with ethnic minorities. You heard what you said there in the film. You've talked about your own country as a terribly divided nation, even comparing it in one speech to Germany in the 1930s and 40s. And you have argued that Sri Lanka should have the humility to admit that it has failed as a nation in some respects. And you talked about your ideas you have respected from your father. You've also been openly criticizing him because he elevated 
Sinhala as a language above other languages. So you've managed to negotiate, you know, through some really, really tricky territory. And do you identify as, as a title, as a peace builder? I think this microphone is, is live. Thank you. First, I wouldn't say, use the word peace builder, I'll say a soldier for peace. Uh, because in my country, we really had to fight for peace. We still have to. Um, just a little correction uh, about the facts that you just mentioned. Uh, during my watch, uh, press freedom was restored. There was no problems with the press. But there were some journalists who um, who, who were killed and who died, and the, uh, including a BBC journalist. One journalist. BBC journalist. That was in the north. She was killed by the tigers. But the investigation wasn't uh, held. But you know, I mean, we can, one can have all sorts of conversations. But th th there were there were concerns. Yes. The right. BBC journalist went up north after she was told not to go, and she had got killed. But we are not sure whether it was the Tigers or the army, but certainly not on our instructions, because the investigations couldn't continue. Uh, apart from that, press freedom was restored. But there were, I mean, human rights organizations have, so I mean, uh, you know, no, there were I concerns I that were. There was one Sinhala journalist who was attacked and killed in Colombo, but certainly not. Uh, under the instructions of the government. Uh, we don't know how it happened, but we think it was vengeance wreaked on that person by a politician. Mm -hmm. Organizing but, him. But, but more broadly, I suppose. But there was you, you overall press freedom. But, um, but there were some human rights abuses. But more broadly, you say it was a soldier for peace. I'm interested in your, in your terminology there. Because it is a battle since the 30 year war that we had in Sri Lanka, which was a terrible, very ruthless war with against a terrorist organization uh, that was fighting for a separate state. Uh, it was a battle. On one hand, a battle against the, the Tamil extremists. Uh, on the other hand, a battle against the Sinhala extremists. Uh, I came in talking of peace, of uh, ending the war, not with arms, but with uh, negotiations, with a political solution. Within 10 days, I wrote to the leader of the, uh, the, the, the terrorists and offered talks. They accepted it because at that time, the people of the North, the Tamil people, were not all terrorists. They wanted peace. And they had confidence in my government. And they, I think, pushed their terrorist leaders who were in charge of that whole area. Um, and they came for talks, but they broke down very fast. We gave them about. 80% of what they asked for. But they were asking for a separate state. And I said, everything else but not a separate state. We'll give you a new constitution with a federal um, government. But they, he didn't want it, so that broke down. Uh, so what I'm saying is, through that, but even after the talks broke down, I insisted, we insisted, on uh, presenting to the country our constitutional draft. So. Four months after the talks broke down, less than four months, we presented to the country the new constitution where we gave or we offered all these rights to the people, to the minority communities. And another section of that constitution, which is not quite relevant to what we are discussing today, was the abolition of the excessive powers of the executive presidency, abolish, total abolition of the executive presidency, because I still feel it has uh, excessive powers. We couldn't get it through because, on one hand, the Tamil Tigers were opposing it, but mainly because we didn't have two-thirds majority in parliament. I was short at the end only of seven votes. Mm. We couldn't get it through. So um, that was one, yes. one battle. The other battle was against the extremist Sinhalese, against the extremist Sinhalese who didn't want the minorities given anything. It is so interesting you talking about your attempt to try and curb the power of the presidency because it seems a really opportune moment to bring in my other guest, another pioneering peace soldier, peace builder, um, the ex excellency Rosa Utunbeyava from Kyrgyzstan. Could you please join us on the stage here?
and it seems to me, uh, you know, absolutely fascinating because you, of course, are the first female leader of a Central Asian country. And just to remind everybody about Kyrgyzstan, that it was part of the USSR till 91, has about six million people, most of them practicing moderate is form of Islam. And among the five of the Central Asian states, which used to be part of the USSR, you are an outlier in a good way, and that's a lot of it is due to you. You've got a PhD in philosophy, German philosophy, although our discussion's not gonna be academic. You'll be relieved to hear German philosophical discussion, perhaps. But, um, and you were a foreign minister when you were working on behalf um, of the Soviet Union. So lots of insights there. You've also been an ambassador in the US and Canada and in the UK. And you're not today, but I hear rumors that you, um, from colleagues of mine who've worked closely with you, that so often you turn up to events wearing traditional Kyrgyz costume because you're a big advocate for your country. Now, in 2010, you helped push the unpopular Bakiev family from power, and then you were immediately confronted by a bloody revolution. There were deaths, people talk about hundreds of thousands of people who were internally displaced, and you were struggling to help get your country back on its feet in the midst of some of the worst ethnic violence of a generation. And we were talking about the role of the president in Sri Lanka because one of the things that you did is you introduced and managed to get passed. So perhaps you can share some tips there. If the constitution, the, uh, a new constitution approved by voters which curbed the power of the president, devolved powers to parliament and established the first parliamentary democracy in the region. And then a year and a half later, you stepped down, the first Central Asian leader to step down in this way in a peaceful exchange of power to your successor. So perhaps at this moment, we could play a short film about you, mm -hmm. if you want to see it. From the beginning, I was not dreaming to be president. I was not dreaming uh, to hold big power. It, it didn't come from the sky uh, to me. I was a leader of opposition in the parliament. After the 2010 events, Rosa Otumbaiwa had the courage to take the responsibility to convene a new constitution of this country, which has literally uh, transformed the country from the authoritarian regime to the democratic parliamentary rule. I set the example that uh, we should uh, uh, transfer the power. It is not yours forever. It is not something imminent to you. You should transfer the power by constitution. президентства вот она как раз таки пример показывает и вот она показывает конечно очень большой пример пример деятельности экс-президента и причем не просто деятельности а вот и э, формирование политической культуры в обществе э, формирование вот э, общественного мнения вокруг образования детского образования you know, you can feel the, how deeply is she is committed in the diversity and how deeply she is committed in the peace and uh, security in the region. 
We want to be country in peace and uh, uh, understanding each other in, in our multi-ethnical society and uh, respectful to each other. And so this is our power, certainly. begin by really talking about the concept of leaders and I've asked both our guests to feel free to it's a casual relaxed conversation they can interrupt me interrupt each other and then you guys get to interrupt and ask questions as well in a few minutes but first of all interesting both of you you talked about being dragged back to Sri Lanka and you Rosa you allow me to call you Rosa say that you didn't dream of becoming a president so, um, you know, what was the call to take on this leadership mantle, which is tough for anybody, and perhaps for some women is even tougher in a context where women haven't traditionally been leaders? Uh, good afternoon. You must understand that in our part of the world, uh, we struggle for democracy. Uh, uh, all the changes which uh, goes in my country, this is in the sake of democracy. 20 years of our development under presidential rule was uh, uh, absolutely unsuccessful for politics, for economical uh, uh, promotion of country, and uh, uh, opposition was uh, so strong. And one day we, uh, we have uh, built uh, parliamentary um, governance uh, constitution and started to promote. And leader uh, whom uh, this leadership is given should implement this. Uh, and uh, uh, because as leader of opposition, I was uh, uh, given such a role uh, in, uh, um, after this uh, very tragical events, uh, uh, I supposed to, Take a, mm, uh, uh, take a faith of the country in the hands and push forward and implement this. Leadership, what you are asking about, so this is uh, really a responsibility. This is persistence. This is uh, uh, the, the vision of the future that you should go ahead uh, regardless of all the obstacles and uh, uh, what gave you the confidence, and it's a question I'm also interested to hear from you, to know that it was you? I mean, it's a responsibility of everybody in a country. But how come you took it on yourself? No, we had a team. I was, uh, I, I was backed by team and uh, yes. uh, a couple of parties uh, backed uh, uh, activity of interim government and so we pushed to go forward and implement our plan to transfer the country from presidential uh, to parliamentary uh, governance. So that's what I have done. And what about you? I mean, you obviously grew up in a family where there was so much leadership, both your father and then your mother uh, taking on the helm of the country. Was this something that you developed and was it expected or was it something that you felt you had to find your own path through? Well. I had decided quite young that I didn't want to take political leadership, uh, but I wanted to work for the country. But the two don't quite, quite match. <laughs> Rather conflictual. Um, I did, when I came back from university, uh, enter the public service and I started work in the Ministry of Agriculture. And I started working with the peasants, which is what I wanted to do. And uh, I thought I could continue like that. But then there was a call. I, people kept on telling me because they believed that the family should continue. I didn't believe that. And there came a time when where there was a lacuna in leadership. And I kept refusing for many, many years. And finally, I couldn't refuse anymore. And did you at all doubt that you personally had the confidence and the ability to do something? Or was it just that the duty was so strong that it overcame any <coughs> questions of doubt? As Rosa said, it wasn't a matter of my deciding whether I could do it or not. There was a very big team. There was a political party. And people outside the party, uh, you know, a collective group that worked together and thought that 
Emilian, I, uh, I want to add that uh, in our um, uh, today's reality, when the uh, uh, role of women after the Sovietization started to diminish all the time, uh, a lot of questions uh, come up uh, in our society that, look, uh, uh, how it's happened, uh, women, and why women, and uh, of course, again, uh, there is a great demand for uh, women's role in uh, our development. Uh, and again, I must tell you, it's not because uh, I was the most ambitious, I wanted to be a leader and number one person, no. All these uh, uh, fellows, uh, leaders of political parties uh, to this moment, uh, uh, usually men uh, for, uh, lead the parties, they decided that I should continue to lead because I was a leader uh, of opposition in the parliament, the voice of opposition. So, And so they decided that, look, uh, you started uh, to work uh, in this uh, direction. Please uh, take uh, uh, the lead. And so uh, inter-ethnic conflict, which uh, uh, took place uh, in the southern part of uh, my country, um, uh, summer uh, uh, in summer 2010, it's happened because you see this. Uh, f um, when you have a big uh, earth, a political earthquake, then all your fragile parts started to broken. And so we had before 10 years ago, such a uh, 20 years ago, we had such a conflict. And so it's uh, that this outbreak was unfortunate, absolutely unfortunate. And so we faced uh, change of radical change of the government. And in our neighborhood, uh, all the countries are autocratic uh, regimes. And mm -hmm. so they thought that, look, uh, these nasty guys, they've done another revolution. <laughs> <laughs> so and, uh, this, uh, their democracy really costs uh, a lot. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, this uh, interethnic conflict uh, um, took place, and uh, we faced with losses, uh, humanitarian crisis, uh, and of course, uh, we, uh, this is uh, uh, our luck and advantage that the international community came uh, to help. I'm, I'm interested in the film. You talked about the fact that other people and you yourself have recognized that you call yourself bossy. And that was in the midst of the tragedy that you were able to think of something so foresightful in order to calm down and pre you know, prevent other violence. But I thought the use of the term bossy was very interesting because would you apply it to a man? <laughs> you mean it's a word that's normally used for a man? For women. I think the term bossy is used in a derogatory way for a woman and for a man you'd say he's got authority. I don't know, I'm, I'm asking you that question. That's a word that's used laughingly by my friends and family, so I used it. What do you think though? <laughs> well, actually, yesterday we discussed this in another way. Um, I think this business of saying uh, women in leadership in politics or elsewhere, um, have to become like men or have to assume the characteristics of a man, I think it's all wrong. Women are women and men are men. And there are strong women, there are weak women, as there are weak men and, weak, uh, and strong men. It's just that for millennia, uh, society has uh, given a dominant role to the man, the patriarchal society. And uh, there are all kinds of uh, concepts that are related to that and hang-ups, but now that that's almost disappearing, the women and men are becoming normal women and men, not, um, not men who are authoritative and women who are dominated. And there can be strong and weak men, strong and weak women. That's interesting. And how and do so you see that? I, uh, uh, I was okay. listening to you and uh, I, t uh, I thought that, look, uh, uh, women's role uh, uh, in the resolution of conflicts in such a hot uh, spots is uh, exceptional. Look at today's conflicts, uh, Yemen, Syria, uh, what uh, Iraq, what other. Would you imagine that uh, women will lead this situation there? And the result will be different, I'm sure. They have actually done research and women who are conflict, uh, who are working on resol and resolving conflict have a better result generally than men do. I think, isn't that right, Shamil? Have you heard that research? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, women's participation in peace process dramatically increases the 
the success of those peace processes in generating and sustaining the results. Absolutely. Mm. Unfortunately, there are many peace processes that don't engage women. Yeah, I'm wondering... Hence UN Resolution 1325. And generally, the uh, situation will be calmed down. People will feel more secure themselves. And uh, everyone will feel about the, uh, think about the families, communities, not about uh, such a force by force, uh, force against force, and so on. So it's completely different uh, thinking and environment. It's interesting about your role as a leader because I understand that in Kyrgyzstan there was a 19th Kyrgyzstan there was a 19th century queen who was a big uh, you know forerunner of you and I was also wondering because you're a, 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 a horse rider you love riding horses and I'm wondering about the kind of freedom and control you have when you ride horses and what I imagine are the kind of fields or you know in your country whether that's something that you draw upon in oh, your it's role a bit as a uh, you have uh, uh, romantic fantasy romantic there. Fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been there. <laughs> so, Good for tourism, though, in Kyrgyzstan. No, romantic, beautiful. Nomadic background only gives uh, such um, <laughs> qualities like decisiveness. Uh, we are not settled nation in some way. So, and uh, <laughs> with this regard, you would uh, make a bold, uh, sweet, uh, uh, such uh, actions. <laughs> You know, talking about men and women, uh, I was talking generally about men leaders and women leaders, but uh, if we talk about women or men uh, in leadership uh, handling conflict situations, then I have to qualify my statement very similar to what Rosa said, because women do through the years and also naturally have a softer approach. Women have to bear children, they have to look after them, they have to feed them. <coughs> so there is a softer, a gentler approach. Women are negotiators <coughs> in the home. They have to resolve problems in the home, fights and misunderstandings. Um, so I suppose traditionally, yes, uh, about conflict. But I meant, you know, people, this other thing, other hang up that uh, if a woman is strong, they say, ah, you have taken on the role of a man kind of thing. And what about both of you, in a way, are similar in that you both were, you know, leaders of your country at a time of extraordinary worst in the generation, extraordinary conflict between the Tamils and the majority government in, um, in your country, and whether you, at any times you felt that you, as a woman, did things that men might not have done, or people projected concepts of what you could or should do as a woman, or was According to you, a non-issue. You were a president, and that was the, the most important thing. Yes. When I was president, I never thought of myself as a woman. I was the president. I was the leader. The people had placed their confidence in me massively, and I had to resolve problems. So I never thought, because I'm a woman, I have to use that. And uh, at most times, I was the only woman in my cabinet, because that was not because I was jealous of other women. But uh, even though Sri Lanka produced the world's first woman prime minister and one of the world's first women executive presidents, um, we have a very poor representation of women in parliament. Even now, it's 3%. Wow. So if I go into analyzing that, that's a different story. It's bad. Uh, the, the present government is bringing in quotas now. They have brought it what, in. What kind of percentage out of interest? 25% for the moment, but not for parliament. They started very temerishously for local government. Mm -hmm. And that has worked. Uh, so they say they are going to go up to the next stage. Uh, but there's a presidential election due in a few months. So after that, we don't know what will happen. So, um, so you know, there were, I had to work with men. Mm. At the beginning, they had been making comments, the senior public servants, oh, this young woman, I was 49 when I became president. What can she do? She has not even run a tea boutique uh, and all this kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I ran my own plantations. <laughs> and, and I was, uh, uh, I worked in various capacities for various organizations, but never mind. Uh, so, and they didn't take me seriously, but they were respectful, respectful, but when I started working and insisting on rules and regulations and anti-corruption and planning uh, economic development and all that, 
all that disappeared. Yeah. And they felt that I was an equal and there was absolutely no problem thereafter. Well, what about you, Rosa? Uh, two uh, responses on my side. Uh, First, uh, mm, uh, uh, women also b uh, lacking in the government. Uh, when I became uh, uh, president, uh, I uh, proposed uh, for the government a couple of uh, women, very able, efficient women, and uh, they've been approved by government. It's not just my signature, but uh, they went to the uh, parliament uh, for approval. So first time uh, prosecutor general became a woman, of uh, Supreme Court's uh, chairwomen. Uh, then uh, it was Central Bank's uh, president became a woman. And uh, uh, later on, uh, after me, um, uh, uh, this uh, accounting chamber, I guess, uh, this is uh, the name. So, uh, I mean, we changed the landscape of leadership uh, in my country. We have uh, also quota 25%. Uh, usually when uh, uh, sit vacates by women, then men immediately fill up of this place now and less women we have. But still, we are fighting for the presence of women. And regarding what uh, not has been done, so unfortunately, certainly, uh, uh, not everything was done in, in such a short uh, term, which uh, I was uh, in uh, uh, my uh, capacity as uh, president uh, and uh, probably uh, I was quite decisive, uh, seems to me, but uh, time was uh, crucial. Time was, uh, uh, time didn't allow me to do many things. Uh, and uh, I regret about this. I regret and uh, I do believe that uh, uh, if longer than I would be able to do more radical changes. After revolution, everyone was uh, uh, demanding illustration. It's very difficult. Uh, illustration. Illustration, it means uh, the whole establishment, the previous, should uh, be rid of. Uh, so it is very uh, painful and difficult process. And uh, in some countries in Central Eastern European, it has be, uh, it, it's mm. done. Mm. And uh, in my country also, they thought that uh, they served the old regime, which was a uh, criminal regime, let's say. And now we should bring completely new uh, generation of uh, um, civil service people. So that sort of uh, things, uh, uh, those are part and components of revolution. And it's very important uh, to, uh, to clean the space for uh, radical good changes in the future. It, it's, it's not been done. That's what I regret also. May I come in there? Yeah. <coughs> to, un to continue the same question, or answers for the question you asked whether women in power would be different, differently managing to men. And also in <coughs> conflict resolution in yes. particular. Well, um, just by the way, uh, also, I forgot to say that, the first woman president of the Supreme Court, the first woman to be a vice chancellor of a university, uh, the first women to be in many high places I, were appointed by me. But uh, about the other matter, you know, we had in Sri Lanka a practice when governments changed. Uh, they didn't send everybody away, but anybody who was thought to be um, sort of supportive of the previous lot mm. uh, would not be sent home because rules are very strong in our country. Uh, and democracy still stands, even though it has been violated many times. So they are transferred to far away places, you know, and that kind of thing. Sinecures, where they can't yeah. cause too much. And to lesser, lesser posts, yeah. people who are senior. I stopped it all, and I said, no political transfers. Uh, teachers were harassed like this, no end. Wow. Because teachers in Sri Lanka, are at a certain level, uh, people don't have, officially do not have political, uh, the freedom to work politically, openly. Uh, teachers had. And they were harassed, they were transferred from one place to another. I said, absolutely no teacher transfers, no public servants to be transferred, and uh, such like. Wow. And probably, uh, if I was a man, it wouldn't have happened. Interesting. That, um, yes. Talking about leadership, I, I, both of you have shown tremendous courage in different ways. And I want to talk about the theme of courage. And um, begin by you, before we you know, open up and go to the floor. 
about what it has taken you in yourself to have the courage to speak out? Because I know this has been at the cost of threats to you and uh, you know personal safety to speak out and criticize your own country in that way whether it was something that built up whether you were thinking in your mind slowly and then it came out or whether it was just something so clear to you that you it, it didn't need a lot of cooking and preparation well first i must say it wasn't criticizing my country it was criticizing some people for the way they managed it, yeah. and for the way they governed it. Okay. Um, and therefore, I also, I would say, had the courage to criticize, uh, though I admire my father immensely, uh, one policy that he adopted, I have criticized. Uh, but I'm interested in the development of that courage, where it comes it came. from. <laughs> you just take it for granted, don't you? I don't know. Well, one thing is I like to be honest. I'm scrupulously honest. Uh, that I think I inherited from my parents, financially and in every other way I think they follow. And I can't lie, number one. And two, be probably because of my highly liberal education, uh, Western-wise, and I went to university in Paris. At the time that uh, May 68 happened, I was on the barricades. So. You know, I believed, and I still believe, that people have to be told the truth by political leaders. So, you know, like saying in my speech uh, during the 50th anniversary of independence of Sri Lanka, I said, we have failed as a nation, the words that you said. And what now would you like to say to the political leaders? I didn't say we have failed as, as a nation. nation. As we have failed in the, in the task of nation building. And what would you like to say now to the political leaders of Sri Lanka? <laughs> Stop robbing. Every one of them are doing it. Very corrupt, to such an extent that I'm disgusted. Um, and because they are so corrupt, uh, there's no vision. This present government, I was also hugely responsible for bringing, helping it to come in. Uh, together with civil society organizations that came out strongly for the first time in Sri Lanka to, in 2015. And one of the major mandates that the people gave us, one was to abolish the executive presidency, which has not happened. The man who became executive president, who's from my party, uh, who I identified and we worked for him and made him the president, um, does not want to abolish it, having promised the people. And secondly, the other main uh, issue was corruption of the previous government. And we promised to rid the state of corruption. And there was a possibility of doing it. Some of us have got together and given papers and notes on how it could be done, how I did it, and how it can be now changed, you know, amended and done. Nobody wants to do it. Everybody's helping themselves to the kitty, uh, perhaps not as badly as the previous government, uh, but Mm. And when they have that, the whole vision that we put forward to the country of economic development, of poverty alleviation, of improving the education systems, of uh, changing the ethical values of, of the society, starting with children, uh, of peace, peace building. Uh, all that has flown out of the window because they're only interested in, in lining their pockets. And what are your thoughts about courage, Rosa? and the courage that you had both you know, as leader of your country and subsequently, where does that come from? I was all the time decisive person and uh, that was uh, really uh, probably uh, my insights, uh, such a mechanism which pushed me to, to, to implement what we uh, thought uh, to do. And uh, secondly, this is responsibility for the country. It's, uh, uh, everything is on your shoulders and you must do your best uh, to bring uh, to the goal. And uh, uh, when uh, uh, this ethnic uh, conflict took place uh, in the south of country, then uh, for huge demand was from neighboring country to do the international investigation. 
and never it, it has been done in the uh, for domain of the former Soviet Union. Uh, there are a lot of conflicts uh, took mm. place uh, uh, in Azerbaijan uh, between Armenia and uh, Moldova and Chechnya and so on. No, none of those uh, places uh, been uh, investigated. So, and so. Uh, in my country also it, it questions how uh, and uh, uh, my ethnic uh, group Kyrgyz, they thought, uh, no, it is, uh, no question is there. But uh, I took a decision to invite uh, such a commission and it was uh, very beneficial for the future of my country. Nobody uh, will uh, uh, accuse us in genocide or uh, military crime. International Commission uh, of, uh, made a conclusion that uh, nothing like that. And have either of you, just very briefly before we go to the floor, have either of you ever changed your mind when you were working with opponents and people who you might have come either the Tamil groups or people who don't agree with you? Have they, have, has the conversation between your opponents or people who are different, has that ever helped you in any way change your mind about anything significant? Not too significant. Uh, this is a very uh, multi, um, uh, multiply process, all this recovery, unification, and so on. And uh, you speak to all sorts of people, youth, women, and uh, community leaders, and so on. So they just... Uh, uh, they try to, uh, um, uh, to to tell something different, uh, but uh, overall, you should lead the line, your line, and at the end, uh, we would come to the joint decision. And what do you think, Sigurd? Well, as far as the Tamil question was concerned, I didn't need to change my mind uh, because the, the, the s solutions were obvious if you wanted to negotiate. And we negotiated with the Tamil Tigers for a long time. Uh, and I only got uh, more convinced of what, of what we thought of the whole question. But I did, because conflict was not, uh, is not only with a minority group or somebody who's, who's you know, waging war. Uh, in the South, in the rest of the country, the two major political parties were at each other's throats, like in most countries. Uh, well, I suppose in old democracies like yours, they do disagree, but they... We all get on fabulously well in this country, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, in our, in our countries, it becomes rather vicious. But working with the main opposition party after I retired from the presidency, mm. uh, because we were all horrified by what the, my successor was doing uh, and his government, and we wanted change, uh, working with them, I did change a lot. Mm. And finally, I pushed and initiated uh, the concept of the two major political parties coming together to fight uh, the elections, the presidential elections. We did. And we brought 49 organizations and political parties together with us. And that's what made us win the elections four and a half years ago. Uh, so and in that sense, I did change my concept hugely. And we are told that is, it's a very, I have been told by friends in the West, they have asked me, how did you perform this miracle? Because they say it's a miracle to bring the two major political parties together. Not only did they fight and win an election, they formed a government together. But after two years, the whole thing started going wrong. And just very briefly, both of you, one quick word of advice to give to your former self when you were in power if you could do that? That's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long answer, and I haven't thought about it. What about you, Rosa? Uh, again, uh, uh, more decisiveness, better use time, because uh, really uh, I, I need the time also. And uh, um, better organize many things, really. That's probably. I would say as far as I, far as I was concerned, well, what comes to my mind spontaneously is if I had worked uh, more closely and in a less conflictual manner with the opposition, we could have achieved more, especially in the resolution of the ethnic question. 
Interesting. Thank you very, very much indeed. So just before we go to the q and I just wanted to invite Shamil Idris, the CEO of Search for Common Ground over the chair, to uh, join us. And um, just, um, just a first question to you, Shamil, because you have just given this special um, award to CBK for showing tremendous courage, um, you know, being so open and critical of the government and those in charge and all the work she's done on peace building. And yet, as we've heard, there's also, you know, a lot of criticism of the time when you were in charge of human rights abuses. Why did you choose to give the Common Ground Award to CBK? Um, <clears throat> well, first, I think it helps to know what Search for Common Ground is. We had an award event yesterday where the award was uh, presented by President Otunbaeva to President Kumaratunga. And uh, our host for the evening, our honorary host, Queen Noor of Jordan, uh, answered the question that she posed herself, what is Search for Common Ground? And that the more than 700 staff and thousands more volunteers and partners around the world were not represented in the room necessarily, but that they included everything from Congolese comedians and former foreign ministers in Central Asia and literally taxi drivers in Niger and others, all walks of life. The reason I go into that in the answer to your question is because our, our team in Sri Lanka is no different. The way that our organization goes about peace building is that we first identify courageous peace builders themselves who represent the dividing lines that they themselves are seeking to bridge in their communities. And so our team in Sri Lanka, established in 2010, represents the diversity of Sri Lanka and all of the contradictions and challenges and beauty of that diversity. And so if you're going to give an award to someone by doing a Wikipedia search and uh, researching what's written about them, that's one thing. But when when you ask your global teams around the world, you know, who deserves really to be honored? And you have team members who literally risk their lives, may still be risking their lives to do this work, who know intimately well who is it that answers the call when you need help, you know, who is actually putting themselves out there, you get a much richer kind of nomination. And so uh, all I can say is in, in President Kamura Tunga's case, I know some of the things that we heard from our team was just in her presidential campaign to begin with, the language of reconciliation, which was not the language of vengeance, which gained a tremendous amount of support and huge electoral victories, first of all, that once she came into power, she selected uh, one of the most diverse cabinets um, in the history of the, the country, that she ran uh, what is largely recognized as the ba best national public um, peace campaign, the White Lotus Movement uh, in, in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, she was the first leader who publicly apologized for the mistakes of the past, including those committed under her own presidency. She led the, uh, by far the most ambitious devolution effort, we heard about it today, to devolve authority from the presidency. And since she's left, she's continued, as we hear today, to be quite outspoken um, in advancing uh, both good governance and calling for it and reconciliation. So these are just a few of the items, but we would be much better served uh, 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 with our local leaders and partners being able to give voice, because that's really where the uh, advocacy for us to do this came from. That's fantastic. And I know the work that you're doing in Sri Lanka is also this fascinating memory uh, project. And could you just very briefly tell me about that? Yeah, so I mean, in every violent conflict, you have this challenge of needing to honor and acknowledge um, uh, uh, and account for the past, and at the same time, not wanting to become permanent prisoners of that past. Um, and so our team uh, established the, the Community Memorialization Project, which uh, 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 supports and records and then publicizes and takes around the world the narratives and the stories of Sri Lankan citizens themselves, uh, Tamil, Sinhalese, all, all the diversity of the country, telling their own stories, and particularly the survivors and the victims of atrocities. Um, uh, what happened to them and to their families? Uh, not just talking about it, but actually coming together to each talk about their experiences. They use maps, so they can draw maps of this is where my husband disappeared, this is where my child was killed in front of me, unimaginable horrors. Uh, they give tours to one another uh, uh, to talk about where these things have happened. And the simple act of telling those stories, oftentimes th where they've been encouraged or outright told to bury it, to not, the simple act of telling those stories is extraordinarily powerful for, for them. They can own the stories and tell them in their own language. Oftentimes in conflict, uh, the stories are only told after there's a victor and then the victor writes the story and it tends to be the state. And in this case, our team has worked very hard to give the voice very much to the people, all the people, to talk about what's happened, how they've suffered, and how they're working to get past it. And in the end of the day, I think it's really also about 
these reconciliation processes or working through transitional justice, um, these can sometimes be rather top-down processes, but when they're truly effective, they're very much bottom-up and top-down. Uh, that leadership needs to create the space for it, but it's really enabling the people to have a voice themselves in memorializing what happened uh, to them and, and honoring it in one another's communities. And so that project has now traveled across, uh, throughout Sri Lanka, but also uh, other capitals around the, around the world, and we'll continue to, to do that. That sounds fascinating, really interesting stuff. And talking about bringing in more diverse voices, it would be great to hear some more voices in the room. Just. Uh, if you want to say who you are, please do so. If you want to keep anonymous, that's okay too. If you keep your contributions brilliant and brief, that would also be marvelous. And we're also excited to be able to take contributions from people in Kyrgyzstan, in Sri Lanka, in America, in Rwanda. And I think, Carl, you're going to be the man who's going to be filtering those uh, uh, thoughts or brief questions. So first of all, anybody in the room got something that they're dying to ask? or make a brief comment about the gentleman over there. And also keen to hear from women in the room too, just, just to put that. Uh, please, sir, you want to say who you are? Sorry, uh, Bobby Carnathan. Great. Uh, my question was for President Kamara Tonga. The, the story that we saw about you leading up to this, I, I, I mean, I found it moving and touching, and it just seemed that the, the courage and the strength that you've shown to recover from any one of those things was amazing. Looking at you now and the way that we spoke about it in the way you talked about it in, in the presentation, it almost seemed like it was the past and almost matter of fact. And I wonder, that's not really the case, is it? I, I wonder how it affects you today and where do you go to, like what, what drives you to get by and how do, you, how do you get, where does your strength come from in light of all the tragedies that you, that you faced? A very beautiful question, thank you. Difficult question. <laughs> well, I must say I haven't. I have been asked this question many, many times. I haven't had to consciously sit down and say I have to now get over all this. I've suffered all this. It, it just happened. I just went on with life. Um, I tried to be a practical person when I had to do, and I always had missions from a very young age. Uh, there were things I wanted to do and achieve. Uh, mainly for the greater good, and I just went on with it. So, you know, there are times that obviously you do break down, you do get emotionally uh, weak, but then I get over it because I have to do something in the next minute. So, yeah. it went on. Yeah, you're, you're nodding And there. the support of, of those around me and our team, whichever teams I had at given times, uh, helped hugely. Now, at the moment after I retired, I only asked for one thing. I was offered all kinds of positions to supervise government. I said, no, uh, we helped you to come in. Now you manage on your own, but uh, that's not exactly the case. I do help unofficially. But I said, the only thing I'd like to do is to head an organization for nation building national unity and reconciliation, which is what I do at the moment. The government created that, but we are a kind of independent government organization. And we do a lot of work with school children, with adults. We use the, me the, the performing arts. Uh, we do lots of things, and it is successful. For the moment, in less than four years, we have touched about 600,000 children between the ages of 11 and 18 with our programs. And they have changed. This is to build unity and, and uh, you know, harmony between them. And uh, we have seen that recently. I suppose you all know that we had a terrible terrorist attacks two months ago in Sri Lanka, um, where they attacked three churches and three hotels and killed 360 people nearly. Uh, but, uh, and it was identified as Islam, Islamist extremists. Normally, the Sinhala people and the Catholics, because there were three Catholic churches, uh, and there are Sinhala and Tamil Catholics in Sri Lanka, they would have gone for innocent Muslim people. This happened previously in other times when Sinhalese people went for the Tamils because somebody was attacked. Nothing like that happened. And I believe it is because of the, the extensive work we have done on reconciliation in the last so many years. Not only my organization, but there are also a few government ministries which have been formed to do similar work and they're going on. So 
that is successful and we go on. But there comes a time when too many shocks and too many traumas may be difficult to take. Thank you very much indeed for, for your openness. Just Thank who you. you are. My name is Sandra Malone. I work at Search for Common Ground. Uh, President Kumaratunga, President Otunbaeva, we're really humbled and inspired and lifted by your courage and your example and your leadership. You mentioned that we have made progress in the world in terms of uh, women in leadership positions and equal rights for all human beings. We also see some rolling back in some parts of the world. Could you share with us some tips for us normal, simple citizens about how we can engage with men around the world to go from she the peace builder to we the peace builders together. Thank you. Can I answer that very briefly? Uh, it's also, I just thought further about your question. It's related. I think one can go on despite all challenges if you have a clear vision and a mission in life. It can be anything. It can be to save uh, elephants. My son was talking about it this morning because he's a vet. <laughs> 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 uh, elephants are endangered at the moment of getting killed. Hundreds of them are getting killed at the moment. So anyway, uh, so, but the mission with a, a, a vision, a clear vision of what you want to achieve in life related to a mission, and of course, a practical action plan. You have to be practical. You have to know how to achieve that vision. That can fire you to go beyond all challenges. And I feel that was perhaps the major reason that I was able to clear many hurdles. And I would say that all of us should, should have that. Rosa, your thoughts? Uh, I, I do believe that uh, you need to work every day, non-stop for promotion of women and all sorts of activity which is uh, now in the world uh, led by the United Nations, by other organizations. This is the right direction. And uh, I don't remember uh, in the past that such an accent was uh, given to the promotion of women. And uh, so many women uh, now, they are on the high position. And again, I, uh, I'm uh, putting this question today. Uh, resolution 1325 gives uh, promotion of women in the conflict resolution. Uh, Secretary General of, uh, promoted uh, to the high position of uh, his uh, uh, representatives, uh, head of those uh, missions, uh, uh, peacekeeping missions in many hot spots uh, in the world. Uh, this is uh, certainly, it's promotion. It is the same quota, not just the men, but the women also against those quota. I just don't understand those women. And I do believe that uh, Scandinavian countries, for example, it, it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen just uh, uh, granted. Uh, they fought for this. And uh, uh, every day, and uh, if we are in any audience, in uh, um, such a multilateral audience, and uh, you would not see someone uh, uh, in uh, of leading the conference, uh, every time Scandinavian women will come and say, why not there are no women? <laughs> and all of us will laugh and think, oh, this crazy uh, Scandinavian. But it is right. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's right stuff to do, absolutely right <laughs> stuff to do. Uh, it's uh, in, in our countries, uh, Look, uh, just uh, uh, men everywhere are men, men, and men everywhere. <laughs> and uh, because we are very quiet and we don't fight, then please uh, sit in the corner. So this is the <laughs> I know. Uh, oh, we got a lady over there, a young lady who'd like to speak. Hello, um, I'm Nora, and this was a question for both President Chenrika and Rosa. Um, what made you want to be president? <laughs> what made you want to be president? <laughs> 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 
You talked about being no, dragged. No, just, uh, uh, for, you see, this is uh, number one position in uh, my country, for example. So, and uh, that was a uh, time of uh, uh, high uh, responsibility and high peak uh, in the development of my country. And that was no man there uh, to take this position. So, <laughs> and that's how I became. <laughs> Well, in my case, too, I had a history of politics in my family. Uh, it was because the country <coughs> had lots of problems at the time I came, came in, and people thought that I could help to so solve the problems and push me there to become the president. I refused for a long time. I refused for about 10 years to contest for parliamentary elections. I was offered seats and all this. And I would like to add to what Rosa said, you know, that we must fight, women must fight for women to get there, uh, for women's rights and, and to get to the leadership, certainly. But I would say when fighting, if women, individual women, can show that they are as strong as the men, that they have perhaps a vision stronger than the men. In my case, that's what happened. I statedly had a very clear vision that I was saying uh, would be the solution to the countries at that time, the, the, the existing problems. And there were no, <laughs> no men in politics who were saying that. It's just that I, I said something the others didn't say. Just so briefly, because I'm really keen to in I had a vision. include the voices who are not in the room. So do you want to well, very I just, briefly? Well, I was a, okay, one word on that. I think th this last question I think is, imp is so important. And I, um, I think we really have to be careful what we define as strength. Uh, and, you know, we were having this conversation yesterday. Uh, I was privileged to be part of the conversation and listening to the two of you. And I, I was mentioning the leadership of Prime Minister Ardern of New Zealand after the Christchurch attacks, the massacres mm -hmm. and the mosques. And it was so telling to me that, you know, uh, under so many conditions, not every male leader, but most of those that, that I'm aware of, would, you would have heard of the language of vengeance, a certain kind of justice. And you know, what you saw from Prime Minister Ardern, in many ways, what's reflected on the stage today, is uh, a kind of strength that I think is much stronger than the language and the impetus towards vengeance. Strength to have a soft approach. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, and right? a vulnerability. That's right. Strength of and, and, and what she has been, if you've seen how she's been reacted to, she's been lauded for reconciling the country. I don't think she's been lauded sufficiently for actually making her country more secure. Because I think that approach actually makes it much more likely, much less likely that people will turn on each other, that people will do an eye for an eye. Uh, it's not just that women reconcile better. It's that this kind of approach, which isn't necessarily a woman's approach, but you see it a lot more from women than men, uh, actually builds much more cohesive and secure societies. So let's, Brilliant. Let, let's get rid of the men and have women <laughs> ruling the whole world. Or, or have men adopt some of these practices, right. the best practices. Yeah, so right. let's just hear from Carl, because I'm very keen. I know people are watching us all over the world, and it would be great just perhaps to sum up. We've only got a few minutes left. One or two of the questions that we can briefly go to our guests for. So yes, there's lots of activity, but in the interest of time, one of the questions that has come up several times from several viewers they want to know what activities are both of you doing right now that you're most excited about? I do run my foundation. As soon as I step down, I uh, set up a foundation, and uh, this is developmental mostly foundation, but I do a lot of uh, um, also uh, such a peace, uh, um, peace keeping oriented uh, stuff also. So. Uh, education, uh, uh, women uh, uh, and children's support, uh, this is high priority in my foundation. And I'm, by the way, setting example what to do after the presidency in our part of the world, because uh, uh, none of them, they want uh, to go, to, to, to be retired. Uh, they uh, <laughs> usually uh, uh, prolonged the uh, time of uh, presidency, and uh, some of them, they, they do believe that uh, this is given for them forever. It is very interesting, rather than by saying, you do it by doing, and there you're providing a strong argument. No, just, Emilia, you can't uh, uh, understand our position. Uh, uh, nobody wants uh, uh, work by constitution and uh, uh, give the position to another one. 
he rather will prolong uh, uh, by constitution uh, do, making another referendum his term three, four times, five times, whatever. This is the problem in our parts uh, of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, soon after I retired, I formed uh, my own foundation too for the same, same type of activity, which is still going on. It is also doing activity to bring people together. Um, it's called the South Asia Policy and Research Institute. At the moment, it's not doing much research. It did at the beginning. It's doing <coughs> active work uh, amongst the people. Then I, I also chair another a foundation which runs a hospital uh, for mainly for women in, near an industrial zone where, uh, which imp mainly employs women. Um, and now at the moment, since the arrival in power of the present government four and a half years ago, I chair the Office for National Unity and Reconciliation, which is doing extensive work in the country for building peace and bringing people together. We, we work a lot in the former war, uh, war zones, uh, doing development work for the people, uh, changing hearts and minds and attitudes with lots of programs amongst children and separate ones for adults, using uh, uh, the arts, especially the performing arts, and such like. We have done a little work with Search for Common Ground, but we can do much more. And uh, I think we must talk about that. Uh, so I do that. And I chair all kinds of other little organizations. May I also add that uh, together with Chandrika, we are both members of the Madrid Club. Uh, Madrid Club, uh, this is the club of the former presidents and prime ministers democratically elected. And we also have a mission to do there. A lot of activity uh, uh, within the Madrid Club. In and other countries, advising other, club, other countries yes. and governments. Exactly. We are members of the Club of Madrid. I was also an advisor to the Clinton Global Initiative. Yeah, that is fantastic. I really feel on behalf of all of us, a very, very big thank you to our two fantastic, inspiring, thought-provoking guests who've been so open and honest in their discussions and their thoughts. And I think everybody here is really, really grateful. Your Excellency Chandrika Banaranaika Kumaratunga, and of course, Your Excellency Rosa Otunbayeva from Kyrgyzstan, a very, very big. Now, before we have time to mingle, and I think there's some puddings and coffees and teas, I just want to, for the last word, to ask Shamil to take the stage. And so, thank you very much for being such a brilliant audience and all those very insightful thank you. questions. Thank you very much for an interesting chat. <laughs> Excellent. So all of you who have joined us online, thank you so much for being with, uh, with us in that way. This is the first of a series of master classes that we will be organizing with extraordinary peace building leaders. They won't always be former heads of state, but we'll do that every once in a while. Uh, everybody in the room, enjoy the pudding as you put it. We are in the UK as pudding. And I'm sorry for those of you watching from home or your offices, I can't give you pudding. Uh, but I want to especially thank our two esteemed guests and our extraordinary moderator, Emily Castro. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And follow and contribute to the She the Peace Builder campaign.